All right, hello, wine drinking people. Time for more of what I've had to drink yesterday. And drinking wine with the world's greatest winemakers is, uh, well, that's what I get out of bed for in the morning. And when the folks from uh, Augustine Wine, the importer or the distributor for Alvaro Palacios, called me up and said, Hey, Alvaro's coming to town. Would you like to do an event with him? God, I thought back, and man, we did an event with Alvaro. I couldn't remember how many years ago. It must be 10 years ago. But sure enough, 2003. And I couldn't find my notes, but uh, one of the people that came to the event last night at the Edge was at the event 10 years ago. And they said it was 2003, we know, because it was um, Israel's 40th birthday at that time. It's his 50th birthday now. And we got another bottle signed for him by Alvaro, so 10 years apart. And, uh, well, he's become somewhat of a legend in uh, the Spanish winemaking world today, even though his family was very well known. Uh, plus, at Romando, the family... Uh, state in Rioja uh, has been around for five generations. Alvaro is the fifth generation. His father sent him off to Bordeaux to study how to make wine at uh, Chateau Petrus, one of the places he visited and worked at. And uh, Alvaro was a very romantic, passionate type, you know. And you know, at that time when he was getting into the involved, you know, growing up in the wine business in Rioja, they wanted to make more wine. What's better, more or less? More. So everybody wanted to ramp up production and you know make hundreds of thousands of cases. And he said, you know, there's got to be areas in Spain. I know there's areas in Spain because, you know, we produce, we have more acreage dedicated to vine than any country in the world. I know there's other places in Spain that can make outstanding wines. And he wanted to find these new, old, great terroirs. Well, new, old? Well, he understood making wine to the extent that he said, in my lifetime, I'm never going to be able to make a world-class wine. If I don't go out and find old vineyards, I don't have the time to go out and plant new vineyards and, you know, make a great wine. I've got to go out and find these old vineyards in Spain. And he looked around. He was selling barrels at that time and uh, became somewhat of an outcast in the family. His father wasn't happy. He wanted him to work at home in Rioja. But uh, like I said, Alvaro followed his passion. And a couple of places he found that he really interesting, Bierzo being one of them and the Priorat being the other. The Priorat kind of won out. His friend Rene Barbera uh, took him by the hand and said, we need to go check this out. And they bought some vineyard land. Actually, the Lermita Vineyard, one of his first purchases, and uh, the gentleman that sold this to him is still alive today. Um, rather getting up there in age, but lives with his daughter in Barcelona, and Evaro says, you know, he still comes back to the property three times a year and brings his friends, you know, to show them, you know, the vineyard that he used to own, he sold to now. One of the greatest wine mines in all of Spain. Very proud, I guess, of that. And, uh, and you know, Alvaro's very proud of this heritage. Very proud of the, uh, you know, this country, his home country, Spain. And there are some incredibly interesting places. And, you know, the Priorat, even though they've been making wine a hundred, a thousand years there, um, you know, it wasn't until the 90s that they started to make great wine there. And this is one of the pioneers of this region. Well, we started out with, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the wines from his home winery, the Placid uh, Rioja Blanco, which uh, a lot of people don't realize they do make some great white wines in Rioja. This one's 100% with the Bayura varietal and really pretty bouquet here, that honeysuckle, a little bit of almond and fresh uh, peaches, uh, really just forward and succulent, delicious nose. And, you know, they don't use a lot of new oak here. They use a lot of older oak, more traditional vinification methods here. But this white is still very fresh and uh, refreshing. Uh, really nice wine. A lot of solid core of the tree fruit there. And then that pretty floral note coming through. Really nice, complex wine. It's just $25, $26 a bottle. All right. Well, we started out with... Um, some Petit Fours, which, uh, well, some nice small uh, little bites here from uh, Chef Aaron Brooks. He did an outstanding job once again with the food and wine pairings and with the dishes and all. You know, the, the beet salad was absolutely fantastic with this uh, Petalos wine and the first wine from the descendants of Palacios. Well, I didn't mention, you know, Alvaro's family uh, deeply involved in the wine business. His nephew, uh, also very passionate about wine. Like Alvaro, he wanted to find these old areas in Spain where they could make great wines. And Alvaro's, you know remembered his time that he uh you know was out look selling barrels and looking and bierzo was one of the areas he also thought was very intriguing as uh, his nephew also came to him and said you know this is a great area i found this place alvaro came to look at it and said all right we're going to go into business together thus the descendants of jay palacios label was formed in 1999 and the first wine from this winery that we got offered oh, we still had this is an area that people still are not very familiar with. Uh, Bierzo, which is uh, the Mencia grape, 
and I have to say the Kurion Monster Bow, which, you know, this is a, an area that they classified, you know, uh, similar to the way that they did Burgundy and, in the 30s and 40s, and they kind of lost uh, their way a little bit, and today they're getting back to that nomenclature where they have the village wines, which would be the Petalos de Bierzo, which is this is some of the fruit that they buy in addition to some of the vineyards that they own. The Kurion, which is the name of the village, and then they have Cruz, which the Monster Bow is one of the crews. They have four crews that they make, three that they release to this country, and one that they just keep in Spain. Here we had the Corian 2009 and the 2001, the very first vintage. The 10 Petalos, well, all these wines have this lovely, pretty floral aroma to them. 2010, a very classic uh, vintage, very fresh. Like I said, that lovely, fresh uh, floral uh, kind of potpourri of flowers, red cherry, red berry fruit, really pretty, really soft and drinkable, really nice with that salad. Had a little goat cheese in it. Also, those fresh, bright reds go really nice with sharp cheese like a goat cheese. They're absolutely delicious. The 2009 Via de Corion, also, uh, you know, very forward, very floral. Uh, that's pretty much typical of wines from this region. You should drink them out of like a Pinot Noir glass, very light, very nuanced. Uh, but a lot of nice fruit, some dark spices in this wine, some caramel kind of toasty oak notes, you know, a little bit of new oak in this wine and uh, just really nicely balanced and very fresh. Uh, the 2009's a really ripe vintage, uh, really voluptuous as the 2009 Corian showed a bit more of complexity there. Uh, lovely intensity in this wine as well. You can just tell this is a wine that uh, really needs a little time to age, even though the 2009's, as I mentioned before, fairly forward. Uh, a little bit more complexity, a little bit more of the uh, slaty kind of minerally notes you get. Uh, some licorice spice in there is all as well. The 2001 showing some evolution to this wine, some dried meat-like notes, dried herbs, uh, plummy fruits, uh, really nice, still has some fruit left to it, but the tannins very soft, and uh, this wine, you know, at or near full maturity, I'd say you could probably keep this wine a little longer, uh, I think Alvaro uh, was very pleased with the way this, white, this wine was showing, and... Um, you know, we uh, we let him get up and, you know, talk about the wine. So he had a little slide show and, uh, you know, really wonderful nights. Great to have, uh, you know, a wine mind like this, you know, to be able to drink these wines with the mind behind that made them. And Christina's wife was there also. It was great to, to meet her uh, 10 years ago. It was just Alvaro. And uh, one of the things I remembered about that tasting was the hot room. It was the middle of summer. And unfortunately, the wines were a little warm. And, you know, this tasting, uh, the little glasses, unfortunately... Uh, the Edge doesn't have a lot of big glasses. You know, it would have been nice to have these Bureauso wines in a nice Pinot Noir glass. But with 10 glasses on the table, it's hard to fit 10 of those Pinot Noir glasses on the table anyways. All right, well, on to the flight from the Priorat. This is what Alvaro's more known for. Um, you know, he came to the Priorat and fell in love with it. Um, actually visited this place with uh, Christina's wife for the first time. Both of them fell in love with it and decided they wanted to, you know, start a vineyard there. And uh, the Les Terrasses. Um, well, actually, the Fingadolfi was the first wine they came out with. I think the 2001 vintage, or 2001 was when it was released, or I'm sorry, 1991 was the first vintage. Uh, 2001, the first vintage of the Corian. But the Les Terrasses came, I think, around the next year later, and then the Lermita came. I think 93 was the first vintage of that wine. The Les Terrasses is a blend. It's mostly um, Karen, uh, Grenache, as all the wines are. And then he does have a little Cabernet. He's got a little Syrah up there also. But like so many people, Alvaro says, you know, every year I try to fit this Cabernet into the blend. And, you know, as of 2006, there's no more Cabernet in the Lermita. He decided finally, you know, look, these are... Varietals that uh, fit or are more akin to this area. Cabernet Sauvignon, an international varietal that, even though it's grown in Spain and, you know, one of the most famous wines in Spain, the black label Cabernet from Torres, from uh, just a little bit further north of here, Alvaro said, you know, he really liked the uh, the way that the Grenache, and there's actually some white varietals, you know, this old vineyard that he bought, Lermita, actually has some indigenous white varietals in there, so this is a field blend, the Lermita, and it was originally 1.5 acres he's planted, uh, Two and a half acres, but those new acres do not go into Lermita, just the old vines. The Finca Dofi, also a single vineyard wine. This wine is about 90% Grenache and a little bit of Syrah and Cab in that. Uh, the Les Terrasses 2011, very young, and uh, has a little bit of that slaty character that you get from the Priorat, but still, in their youth, these wines show this lovely, gorgeous raspberry, red berry uh, fruit, a really succulent and a lovely floral notes and herbal notes, uh, you know, kind of pine trees and rosemary is the terroir here. You get that coming through in the wine, the 2011, a very charming and forward wine. The 2010 
You know, this wine's a little bit light, and this wine may gain color a little bit in the bottle, but has great structure, great freshness, needs a little bit of time. 2002, um, the Finca Dolfi showing brilliantly. This is a vintage that was not considered a very good vintage at all. And Alvaro said we really had to do a strict selection. We had to thin, you know, the, the, the grapes. Some of the grapes were rotting in the vineyard that, because of the rain. They had to, you know, take out the rotted grapes. And, you know, with selection and with, you know, good farming techniques, you could make a good wine in 2002. And this is proof. We still have a few bottles of this wine at the same price as the current release. How do we do it here at Wine Watch? I don't know. Anyway, so 2009 Lermita, still a baby. This wine scoring uh, nearly perfect 97 to 100 points. I always say you can't drink points, but you are going to pay for them. This wine has gotten 100 points in the past, and it's now $1,000 a bottle. Well, it has to do with the 300 case production level, but really crushed a, a, a rock here. You get a really strong sense of minerality in this wine. That's what you get from the old vines going deep down into the soil and pulling up the minerality. That's why I'll better realize... I need old vines to make a great wine. I don't have 25 years to plant a vineyard. And, you know, as a young guy, you want things to happen as soon as possible. And still a relatively young guy and now considered, you know, one of the legends of Spanish winemaking, modern-day era Spanish winemaking. Anyway, so 2000 Lermita, this wine had about 30% Cabernet in it, and you really noticed it in the color in this wine, much darker than the 2009. And uh, this wine showing brilliantly, still really drinking nicely, has a lot solid core of fruit still, still got some uh, years left to it. I like Priorat more on the young side, but I have to say, between these two, I like the old wine better. The 2009 just needs time. Still very tightly wound very young and uh you know it's got all the pieces there just needs a little time for them to come together that's what we had to drink with alvaro and cristino palacios i'm your host andrew lampasoni signing off for the wine watch saying remember always drink the good stuff first